that worked. <laughs> so why don't we go ahead and get started? We will call the meeting to order at, let's see, 332, Thursday, March 9th, meeting of the Park Board. Any additions or deletions to the agenda? I know Chris said she's taking care of the roll call, so we won't, won't do that one. Then if no additions or deletions to the agenda, we will move to public comment. We do have three guests here today to provide comment. If you could limit your comments to three minutes. So we'll go ahead and get started. I have Karen Mobley on top, so Karen, take it away. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be back. Um, I just wanted to come, I'm a neighbor near to Lincoln Park, and I wanted to extend my appreciation for your vote at the October Park Board meeting, um, which is allowing us to keep our local neighborhood park as a natural area, which is very important to me personally and to the ground breeding birds of our local habitat. Um, we've been, and when I say we, the neighbors have been corresponding with a variety of people, both on the park board and with Garrett and Nick, and we are looking towards finding a more permanent solution for the natural land that is in Lincoln Park and in Underhill. Um, we know the history of the park. We know that when they tried to build the South Hill Senior Center, the neighbors fought back and it ended up in a different park. And then we realized, of course, that you were going to do a different development there and we were very active in opposing that. But we want to be helpful. And I know that a lot of us have been attending the dog park meetings. We've spent some time looking at alternative sites. We also are really interested in figuring out the best way to come up with a legal designation for the natural lands in Lincoln and Underhill. And so, once again, I just want to tell you that we're interested and that we would be happy to meet and convene with you around that. I appreciate the work that Nick is doing and the very difficult position they're in with working on the new bark dog park locations and spent some time on Monday at what I thought was a really great meeting talking with the various neighbors. Um, I am concerned a little bit about the upriver location because as with Lincoln and with Underhill, as far as I can tell, there's been no environmental analysis on that location. I do think it looks like a good location, but I think before somebody were to do something there, it would be good to do the same legwork that we did kind of after the fact at Lincoln at Underhill because I think there could be something there that might be of concern. Anyway, thank you for your, for your consideration. Thank you for your comments. Sam Mace. Thank you, and I'll keep mine brief too. Mostly, I just wanted to come down and extend a heartfelt thank you to Parks and Garrett and Nick and everyone to listen to neighbors and protect our natural areas uh, in District 2. Um, I've been going up to Lincoln Park a lot too, and I'm just uh, wowed by that incredible landscape there. And I can't wait to go up there in spring and spend a little more time. And just really grateful for Underhill. Uh, we just lost a quarter of the forest in the Underhill area uh, within two weeks. Mm. Uh, you know, and I was so grateful that the lands committee was open to if we were able to purchase that land of having it come into the park because it was a chunk of land that had been used for generations as part of the park. A lot of park staff down there didn't know that it wasn't part of the park actually. And it's a huge loss and it really affected what Underhill looks like on that side. And if we'd had that loss and the loss of the natural area on the other side, it really would have truncated the values in Underhill Park, so thank you. Uh, like Karen, you know, there's a lot of folks that have been talking together now about, okay, how do we become advocates and how can we support parks in protecting these natural areas around the city? I was really encouraged of reading the park's master plan and the public survey of the enormous public support that was reflected in that for people wanting more natural areas. They want natural areas protected. They want to have soft paths, not just paved, railed, logged paths. Those have the, their places, obviously. And so I know, I think across the, 
city, we're gathering people together to be a group of folks to advocate and support the protecting and see whether there's opportunities or possibilities to uh, create more of it when we can. Um, we're certainly, you know, <laughs> we're, we're certainly not gaining it right now. So again, just thank you and really look forward to working with parks more closely. Thank you. Thank you. Kirsten? Hi, Kirsten Angel, a uh, member of the Spok uh, Spokane Sustainability Action Subcommittee. Thank you for seeing the value in Lincoln Park as it is in its natural state. Thank you for agreeing to place protective designation on it. My first request today is that you ask parks to prioritize this action. After Lincoln Park was put back on the table for consideration as a dog park, you can imagine that several of us in the community who had testified and witnessed the board vote last October, our confidence was a bit shaken. I assumed that parks saw the value of Lincoln Park to this community as it is a natural park. Luckily, it was taken back off the table. But as a result of witnessing this process of site selection and the lack of, eva of evaluation of this and other sites for their significance as natural, i.e. home to rare native plant diversity, bird populations and nesting activity, connectivity, connectivity to other natural places, I began to wonder, how are these important and potentially impactful land use decisions being made? Are the values of nature in its natural state of value to parks? I would hope so as that is what the public clearly reflected is important to them in the park survey with 60% of people saying they want more natural areas, not less. So what is the process being used to select sites for this dog park? I attended the dog park meeting this week at Mullen Elementary and it looks like the nine acre parcel on Up River Drive right on the river will likely be the next regional dog park. The parcel was described as just some grasses and trees now, based on the lack of ecological evaluation done at Lincoln Park, Underhill, and Hazel's Creek, I'm guessing that an ecological evaluation, or EIS, was not done before the decision to offer it up as a potential dog park site. I could be wrong, and I'm prepared to be corrected, but I'm asking the question, how do we know what values this parcel may be providing our community if we don't do an ecological evaluation? Are grasses and trees of value? Is that land of value to deer populations getting to the river for a drink? Maybe they use other routes, maybe not. Are there rare or endangered native plant species on the land, as there are at Lincoln Park? It is very possible that a dog park is the priority once the evaluation is weighted against the public need, and I'm down with that. I agree wholeheartedly that we need a regional dog park. I'm just using this as another example of how the current process of decision making may be missing an important piece. There doesn't appear to be a standard process through which these sites are being valued as natural for their natural benefits. Lincoln Park is a perfect example of why it's imperative to evaluate, to, a place, to place value upon these natural places for their natural benefits. If there are other places that provide significant ecological and sociocultural benefits, shouldn't we be protecting them for us, but also for future generations? As Spokane continues to feel the pressures of growth, these places will be impacted unless we do something to ensure that they are protected. That begins with, at the very least, evaluating sites for their natural benefits prior to making impactful land use decisions. So my second request, please consider developing a toolkit for evaluating Spokane's natural lands for their ecological and sociocultural significance. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let us move on to the consent agenda. We have four action items on the consent agenda. Is there any board member that would like to edit the current c consent agenda? If not, I will then mo make a motion that we approve as listed. Second. Barb, second. Any other comments on it? All those in favor, aye. respond with aye. Or aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. That was unanimous. So we have moving past that. We have no special guests listed. So then we will move to the financial report and budget update by Mark Bunig. And Park Board, you're not seeing double. There is two individuals here. So um, I'll mark you have this a will older be, version. Uh, Mark Bunig's last um, financial report, and it's, he's going to go out with a bang. So you're, you're going to get the, the 2022 year end, and you're going to get a year to date for 2023. And then Mr. Rich Lentz behind him. 
uh, our new budget and finance director that came from STCU, a great find, uh, great personality, great fit for Parks and Recreation. So super excited for Rich. And thank you, Mark, for the, tr we, this is unheard of, of what you're seeing here, as far as the transition to have two people be able to train off and, and work with each other. So it's been a, a great mm -hmm. uh, compromise from Mark to, to stick around. And so thank you, and we'll give it, give it a, your best shot. Go out strong. <laughs> we didn't get a financial report last month, but you get two of them today, so <laughs> we get some catching up. And um, anyway, Rich is the, the new and improved version, <laughs> and I'm sure that, uh, we'll carry on the tradition. So uh, starting off, we're doing our year-end financials for 2022. Uh, let's see here. There we go. All right. So our first set of slides uh, shows this wrap up of 2022. And as I've mentioned in many of our past meetings, the current financials are compared to a budget usage based on a two year prior average. Uh, this has the effect of the parks fund reflecting both 2020 actual expenditures and revenues being higher than the budget average since 2020 and 2021 were kind of unusual years. Um, and 2022 reflects a much more typical year as parks activities resumed a more normal uh, level of activity. So in our first slide here, we see a comparison of our actual 2022 expenditures to the uh, historical two-year average budget. And we see that the year-to-date expenditures are quite a bit higher than the budget average. However, this amount uh, includes the $1.25 million that was transferred to fund 1950 for our parks capital repair and replacement in our capital program. And in addition, the 2022 expenditures include a retroactive COLA for employees for uh, past years. Uh, and, and, in, and including this transfer amount, the 2022 expenditures exceeded the historical budget by about $3.3 million or about 17%. Our next slide shows our 2022 revenues compared to the historical average, and our actual revenues exceeded the budgeted average by about $2.1 million, or about 10%. Compared to last year, our 2022 revenues exceeded the 2021 revenues by about $1.3 million. And here in our last slide for the Park Fund, uh, we see a comparison of year-to-date revenues to year-to-date expenditures. And we see that our total revenues exceeded our total expenditures by about $124,000. We were very quite close. Now, if that $1.25 million transfer is factored out, the 2022 net revenues exceeded the 2021 net revenues by about $138,000. So, if that was factored out, it was very, very, it was a very, very similar uh, financial picture. Um, any questions on the park fund at the for the year end before we look at the golf fund? All right. So our golf fund in this slide, we see that our 2022 expenditures are above the historical average by about 11%. Our total actual expenditures are about 846,000 greater over last year, reflecting a lot of the uh, inflationary increases in temp labor, fuel and fertilizers, and an increased amount of, of maintenance expenditures. Uh, also, the year-to-date debt, uh, year debt service payments on the SIP loan used to upgrade the irrigation systems increased about $450,000 uh, over 2021. And capital expenditures on necessary capital renovations and upgrades are approximately $275,000 over this over the over 2021. Retroactive colas, as in the park fund, were also paid out of the golf fund. Um, this shows our actual total revenues, including the including the facility improvement fee are above the historical budget by about $204,000. Our total 2022 revenues exceeded total 21 revenues by about $292,000. And our last graph 
uh, we see the comparison of 2022 total actual revenues to actual expenditures. We see that total revenues exceeded expenditures by about $781,000, and however, note that this does include the facility improvement fee. Any questions about 2022 before we move on to the new year? All right. The first financial report for 2023. Um, this includes all the financial activity through the month of February. Uh, the financials once again are comparing the current year's activities to the budget averages of 2021 and 2022. So if all goes right, we shouldn't see as much disparity between actuals and budget as we did in, in 2022. So here in this first slide, we see a comparison of actual 23 expenditures through February with the historical average. Uh, the year-to-date expenditures are slightly higher than the budget. The difference is about $23,000, which is about a 1% variance. Uh, actual expenditures through Febu February are almost exactly the same as last year. There was about a $6,000 difference. In, the, in this slide, our year-to-date revenues are compared to the historical average. Actual revenues exceeded the budget average by about $173,000, or about 5%. The 2023 revenues exceeded the 2022 revenues at the same point in time by about $65,000. Now, in this slide, we see a comparison of year-to-date revenues to year-to-date expenditures. Total revenues exceeded total expenditures by about $1.6 million. However, this is pretty typical for the first quarter of the year. Our parks activities are still pretty low and our general fund transfer is consistent. We also bill for some uh, budgeted revenues and we try to get those in the first quarter. Um, the 2023 net revenues exceeded the 2022 net revenues by about $97,000. So all in all, things are actually very, very similar to, to the same point in time last year. Any questions before we move on to the golf fund? As I flip the slide. <laughs> In this slide, we see that our 2023 year-to-date expenditures are above the historical average by about 60%. However, our total operating expenditures are about the same, ex about exactly the same as last year. The major difference is the payment for the substantial tree removal project uh, due to the eradication of the bark beetles. So we're kind of doing our capital, parks capital program a little early this year. Our actual 2023 total revenues, including the facility improvement fee, are below the historical average by about $50,000. Uh, total 2023 revenues are below 2022 revenues by about $20,000. However, the cold, uh, snowy spring we've been having hasn't been, hasn't been helping out the Gulf Fund revenues so far. And here in this last slide, we see the comparison of actual revenues to our actual expenditures. And we see that total expenditures exceed revenues by about $300,000. And however, this again is due primarily to the tree removal project, our, our accelerated capital program. And this does include the facility improvement fee. So that concludes the reports. Any questions or comments? Thank you, Mark. It's, mm -hmm. it's been a privilege working with you over the years. And Very likewise. Much. It's been six and a half years, and it's a, you, the park board has been an outstanding uh, group of folks. And it's been an awesome time working with the great staff at parks. Um, it's been a it, thoroughly enjoyable experience so it's all it's been very very nice very very good and you have some big shoes to fill rich all right thank you thanks mark so much all right moving forward we have no special discussion or action items so we will go to committee reports and start us out, uh, Kevin, if you would, with urban forestry. 
Sure. Uh, this month's meeting was canceled, and our next meeting will be April 4th at 4.15. February is often a month <laughs> with many closures and many, yes. many meetings that aren't held. Yes. So thank you, Kevin. Nick, if you would take us away on the, uh, the golf committee. Uh, golf didn't meet either this month, and our next meeting is April 11th. I can't, I, I believe, I can't see the online agenda, so that's what I'm guessing. Yes. Yes. Correct. That is correct. Goodness. Thank you, Nick. And actually, now we have uh, Greta with our <laughs> one and only action item for the day also. Yes. It's up to you, Greta. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Land Committee did meet. And we had three action items, two of which were on the consent agenda that passed today. And the other action item, which uh, Nick, I believe, will provide a presentation. It's a, we thought about putting it on the consent agenda as well. It's an easement request and that we approved. But uh, we thought we'd let, <laughs> let Nick make a presentation and highlight the process that we went through. We're trying to be more thoughtful about um, when people come and ask for easements and long-term leases and things on park property um, that that we um, that we're just thoughtful about what we get in return etc so Nick will go over um, the process on this one started in November they came to us I think as an action item um, and we sent it back uh, to revisit a little bit so go ahead Nick yeah, thank you very much. I'm kind of weirded out by the mic situation. I'm not sure if I should be over here or over there, <laughs> but I'll be at one of them. Can you hear me okay? I think you yeah. should move. Yes. It is a little awkward. Yes. Yes. There you go. There you go. Is this better? Yes. Oh, I don't know what's going you on You look there. better. It's better for you to sign. Is it Thursday? I don't know. Uh, okay, so Peaceful Valley, there we have an agreement with uh, Richard Palmer, who is a developer who owns land adjacent to the city of Spokane down in Peaceful Valley. Um, he originally approached us with an uh, informational request to secure both a utility and an action easement from the City of Spokane Parks Department, uh, and then eventually followed up with action. And thanks to our guidance from the Park Board, I think we've got a solution for you today, um, at least for your consideration. So Peaceful Valley, you see that on the map here. If you come into Peaceful Valley, there's um, Clark Avenue is the diagonal road kind of running bottom left to top uh, middle. And then Bennett Avenue is the Gray Street where it says developer owned parcels. So on Bennett, this is the 2400 block of Bennett. The developer owns all of the red lots in the red box or the red polygon there. And the city owns a number of lots that are in green. Um, and you'll notice that the driveway for the developer, there's an old historic homestead that's been on this site for you know, over 100 years that has accessed across the city property, but there was never any documented easement for that. So they don't have legal access and they want to build on this lot. And so they need to be able to secure that legal access. So that's why they're here. Um, there are two easements. One comes from the north, which is what you see in the red box there, which their request is for an underground utility easement. That's to put in water and sewer. And that would be to excavate to put in that water and sewer and then to bury that excavated material and then after they're installed the uh, utilities to restore the park landscape that's there. Um, there wouldn't be any trees that are planned to be removed as a part of that but it would be lawn and landscape that's dug up and then replaced. Um, and they're offering compensation for that. Uh, initially, um, the city engineering department asked us to build uh, a 30 foot wide easement was what they would require for this sort of activity, which is really wide. And so uh, the park board didn't like that very much. Uh, thanks to Greta and, and Jennifer, we heard, you know, that's just not going to work for us. Find a way to get it to as small an area as possible. And we were able to work with the developer and engineering services to allow an area of 16 foot wide. Actually, it's 20 21, but five of it is on the adjacent lot right all the way up to the wall of the house. So it's on his property as much as possible and then a little bit onto ours as well. So that easement area was reduced and that is coming to allow water and sewer. The other is an access easement. This would be a 16 foot wide easement to accommodate a 12 foot wide gravel road um, that would come up to his property crossing city of Spokane in the approximate red areas there. Initially, that was shown at 25 feet, again, required by city engineering. Um, we worked with them at the request of the park board to reduce that area to a smaller area, which is now shown at 16 foot. So, ex excuse me, that's, yeah, 16 foot. So both 16. So fairly straightforward, you've got utility easement and you've got 
access easement. There is an easement agreement in your packet that shows the roles and responsibilities, and I think one of the high points to hit here is that the park parcel in green on the corner there, that triangular piece, we want to make sure we preserve public access to it and actually enhance it through this process. And so we did ask um, a require that the developer not be able to sign this in a way where it looks like a private drive, so it looks like a public drive. They are not allowed to gate it. They are not allowed to block it. They're not allowed to prevent public access. They're actually required to enhance the public access up to that property there just to the north. So that is in the language of the agreement. The developer and the subsequent owner of the home would be required to maintain that road on their own at no cost to us in perpetuity. So that would be applying to both the road and to the utilities. Uh, the impact you'll see from the initial draft on this, which was around $24,000 in compensation to Park Fund, is that that compensation did go down to about $16,600 as a result of reducing the easement area. Initially, um, we had proposed the access easement at no cost because it was historically accessed across our property for the last you know, 100 years or so, and we heard that that needed to be valued. And so we did establish a fair market value for that easement area that, of that access, and that is included in that $16,600. Um, of course, us, our park plan is going to say what we need to secure a net improvement for the park system as a part of these agreements. We don't just give away easements for nothing. And so uh, the important thing here is that we would direct all of the 16,600 and so dollars in compensation into a fund for development and improvement of parks in Peaceful Valley. Um, we do have an active request from the Peaceful Valley neighborhood to build garden beds, which were removed by the city stormwater division when they built some big swales in Peaceful Valley right along Water Avenue. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to be able to, at least at first, buy all those garden bed materials and provide a new community garden space for the neighborhood as a part of this. Um, and then we would have some money left over for maintenance and other improvements as the neighborhood sees fit. So that's the proposal on the table for you. Uh, any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, in terms of the enhancement that you are asking of the owner of that property, what does that look like on that corner? Is there anything specified? So right now, our requirement would be that he take care of that parcel in a, to a condition that our operations staff would uh, approve of, but also that they're not allowed to improve it into lawn and landscape manicured park. We want it to remain in a natural setting. So it's really weed control and, and maintenance of the reseeding of the area he disturbed. So we're advocating for it to remain in its natural state today. Thank you. Yeah. If I might, Greta, I just wanted to uh, outline quickly why we wanted Nick to talk about this. Um, because it illustrates the kind of process we would like to have going forward as we look at the value of parkland and how we let partnerships happen. Uh, you'll notice, number one, we reduce the negative impacts. Number two, we assessed for a fair market value of the access area. Number three, the funds that would be required or acquired as a result of this payment would be set aside to be impactful in the neighborhood where this is taking place. Number four, we think parks first, and what we get out of this is a permanently maintained road with access to other park parcels in that area. So that's the benefit to parks. And number five, we reiterate this is not a sale of park land. Park still owns the land. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. All right. Any other questions? No? In that case, I would like to move that... We approve park parcels 25133.2012 and 35133.2103, access and utility easement agreement in Peaceful Valley in the amount of $16,687 in revenue. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, say aye, or raise your hand, or both. Aye. 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 Uh, opposed? I believe the motion carries unanimously. Uh, Barb. Thanks a lot. Barb, seconded Barb, you seconded to that? Yes, Correct. Yeah, Barb. Okay, Barb. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Nick. <laughs> Chris asked, asked us to help. Identify who seconds things, so she. Oh, it's too confusing. It helps to make it sure. <laughs> Barb Ritchie. A lot of times, yes. but first Ties. one and the second one. It's a Barb Ritchie second day. Both, yeah. both right. motions. 
And as usual at land, we had some uh, good discussion items at, at the beginning of the meeting, um, but right before we had public comment, Garrett um, informed the committee and the public that Lincoln Park was no longer under consideration for the South Hill Dog Park. And then after that, we had um, public comment, similar to the public comment we had today about um, designated Lincoln Park as a natural land. And as I understand it, the park board can make that designation. Is, is that true, Garrett? Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't it need to be an action item at land committee, though, first? First and then be approved. It sounds and like a land committee type action I would item. think so. Yes. <laughs> yes, but I mean it has to actually be as an action item on the land committee agenda to move forward. To Correct. So, so that's we, the next And we step are works. starting to work on that. Correct. Um, correct. Yep. Great. Um, and then we also had a discussion. Avista came and made a presentation of their Metro to Sunset transmission rebuild project, mm. which is all along the bluff and they've been working with Friends of the Bluff and, and Parks, and I'm sure others, on um, how they're gonna, first of all, how they're gonna do the construction and then how they're gonna um, button things back up after they leave the site. And we had another discussion item. A group uh, came and made a presentation on memory gardens. Mm. And memory gardens oh are not memorials, we learned they are um, safe, calming refuge gardens for people with dementia, autism, or similar um, types of disorders. And they, this group would like to perhaps place one in a park. And as I recall, it's a quarter to a half acre uh, of space. And, and so um, I think that's another thing we're going to move forward with exploring and partnering on. Um, so yeah, that was our exciting land committee. And the next one is 3.30 p.m. on April 5th at the Sister City Conference Room on the first floor of City Hall or virtually via WebEx. Thank you, Greta. Yeah. You always have the exciting things to talk about. I have about. one of the more exciting committees, I'm You do, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Though I'm not a golfer. So. <laughs> Well, we won't hold that against you. No. Well, I am. I'm, I'm not either. So. I, I was going to say, wait a minute. I try. Yeah, come on. All right. The rec committee. Sally, you want to st start us out with that? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Recreation met, and we did not have any action items, but we did have some uh, great reporting out. And I think Jennifer was going to share some 2022 highlights and then I'll uh, run through some other updates for you. Um, so I think Jennifer's gonna share her screen. Is she there? Mm -hmm. Chris is gonna share. Oh, she's oh, there. Perfect, hi, <laughs> hi Sally, I'm here. Hi, <laughs> Fire Ford. Um, at the Rec Committee, we did go over the 2022 year at a glance highlights and summaries. Um, the recreation team is amazing and they continue to increase what they do and just provide for our community. Uh, as you can see on this slide, almost 3,000 recreation programs were offered in 2022. We had over 22,000 participants in our programs. Um, over 144,000 people attended our free open swim at our six aquatics facilities. And the thing that was really amazing about last year was we were granted those SEEK funds that were federal dollars that allowed 724 youth to participate in our programs free of charge. Um, it was remarkable. We definitely saw that there's a need for that and we're moving forward to try to work on creative ways to continue to provide something similar. Um, and then again, with our athletic facilities, like Merkel and Southeast Sports Complex and Franklin, we saw um, close to almost 9,000 facility reservations there. So it was a wonderful, very busy year. And we're looking forward to 2023. And Sally, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Sally, are you muted? I... No, she's not. She may be frozen. No, is she there? <laughs> Sally, are you frozen? Technology. I see movement. We're not getting any, nope. any audio Sally, from you, Sally. Turn. There we go. Still not. Am I there? 
Yes, you were there. Yes. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Sorry, I'm having a, a technology day. <laughs> So thank you, Jennifer, again, to um, repeat, the team has just done an outstanding job of uh, navigating and innovating uh, the REC program. I want to say also, um, on February 16th, our board met with the um, Facilities District and Sport Commission Parks and Rec staff, and we had the opportunity to talk over operations and spring-summer programming for the podium. Um, the, I, I think the, the best takeaway of that meeting was that Everybody is very committed to working together to find solutions that work for everyone. It's, it's um, uh, a, a challenging situation that we didn't really anticipate, and uh, nobody has chartered territory. So bear with us as we navigate that with everyone. You will get a full um, update at the board retreat next week uh, and a presentation on what's going on with the podium from our partners. Also, um, also, the recreation staff, it was a privilege to um, have most of recreation staff attend our committee meeting, mm -hmm. and they had an opportunity to present on each of their areas and meet the new board members that are in the committee. So I want to thank everybody, staff that came, took the time to come and, and share their areas of expertise. The um, adult uh, athletic our participation numbers continue to exceed previous enrollment. Uh, Corbin Arts Center, quarter one, has already exceeded year one this year. We still have almost a month to go. And then the other um, thing there is the staff is planning the 125th anniversary celebration events for later this year at the center. Uh, Outdoor Rec continues to bring back pre-pandemic programs with success and continues to try new programs to get more people enjoying recreating outside. Just a been a huge win. As an example of something new was a family-friendly no school day snowshoe trip for Martin Luther King. It was well attended. The um, therapeutic recreation service continues to provide quality of life enhancing recreation opportunities for individuals with physical and mental challenges. A big thanks goes to the Park Foundation funds and donations from Gonzaga Ski Club, TRS was able to purchase a new ski seated ski that allows people with limited or zero lower body mobility to ski for the first time or enjoy an activity left prior to an injury or incident which left them unable to. And then another really cool thing is through the National Parks and Recreation Grant Wellness Area is offering dementia friendly program enhanced fitness for healthy aging programs that is geared towards improving balance and strength of participants to prevent falls and regain some independence. And then lastly, it's hard to believe, but in about eight weeks, we're gonna see um, uh, registrations already open for aquatics and, and lessons, but Whittier uh, pool will be open, even though we're having snow tomorrow. And that's it for recreation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sally. <coughs> All right, let's go with the Riverfront Park Committee, and that would be Jerry. Oh, thanks, Bob. Um, just want to draw the board's attention to the recap, and I think you all got that. Uh, you should have that handy. Uh, we did not meet, but anyway, um, this is something that, that John and his team have put together, and I brought a copy of it because we had talked at one point and within our Parks and Rec Department, I think we mentioned this a couple of meetings ago, we have a few trophies mm -hmm. around. And uh, <laughs> we're going to have to start thinking about finding a place to put them. Garrett's hogging them. Yes, <laughs> let's see. But I, I would like you to take the time and look at this recap that you have in your file because it comes from uh, the Brownfield Group and they have recognized Riverfront Park for its redevelopment. And what that stands for, folks, is taking land prior use of industrial commercial purposes. And I think most of us can think back to the uh, tons of dirty dirt that we moved about and what we now currently have. In fact, we were talking about as a family, uh, 
what it was when I started on the park board, and the only thing we had was the skate ribbon. So I know that's pushing things back a bit, but uh, if you look at it now, it's really pretty exciting. So um, take a look at the website, and you can go to Brownfield 2023, whoops, colon, 2023.org, and uh, Phoenix Dash Awards for 2022 as well, and find out all the specifics. So kudos to John and his staff. I think it's a phenomenal thing. <coughs> and we are going to meet in April, and it will be on the 10th, or the, yeah, on the 10th, and we meet at 4 p.m., and we're going to be in the pavilion. Um, and depending on the lightness in the evening, John has offered that uh, for some of us on the committee, if you need a, a ride from the parking lot or wherever, uh, we'll take care of that. So you have every reason to come to the pavilion. <laughs> <laughs> See you all then. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. The Finance Committee met Tuesday, March 7th, in hybrid format. Mark Bunig presented both the 2022 and February 2023 financials. Overall revenue increased by approximately $1.3 million, but this was offset by a $2.8 million increase in operating expenses. Parks did complete the year with a positive income of approximately 124000 Revenue generation and operating expense management are critical to Parks' success in 2023 and future years. Both of these topics will be discussed at the board retreat next week. So our next finance meeting was, will be April 11th at 3 p.m. and also in hybrid format. And Jennifer, you're doing DVC now. How about that? <laughs> so the DVC did meet on February 15th, and um, we started talking about the February 9th vote of the new policy and procedure for adopting a park, and this adopt a park idea isn't a new one to parks. It had been utilized a couple of decades ago, but it has been reinvigorated, and what it does is to help support those groups and those individuals who want to caretake and partner with us uh, for their parks. And so there's sort of a three-step process. You start out as a volunteer, and of course, you can see on our parks website a large volunteer, um, uh, I think it's called Galaxy is the software, but it's a, a volunteer pool that you can join. And then if you want to become active in your neighborhood park, and I think you only have to do an activity once a year or maybe twice a year, then for Adopt a Park, and you begin to coalesce around perhaps a couple of neighborhood leaders. And then if you decide you want to fundraise and become more actively involving, uh, involved in shepherding your park, you become a park's friends group. So um, this Adopt-a-Park process leads people through that depending on which level of involvement they wish to have. Um, and it provides that staff liaison right now. That's Fiona Dixon, very capable staff liaison to work with our public and um, see which level they'd like to be at and how they would like to proceed. For some people, they might stay at the Adopt-a-Park level um, or some perhaps um, really want to go straight into a Park Friends group. So um, there, are, there are ways to do that. And what this does is create that toolkit and those procedures. Um, so that's what we're working on. Um, and we're working on that with the DVCAC, but I'll have Kelly Brown talk about that in a little bit. We also talked about the fact that for, and she's getting ready, boy, I gave her a start. Uh, <laughs> we also talked about the fact that for some groups, if they want to become more formalized, um, they need insurance. You know, you become, to, you become part of that process for fundraising. As a park friends group, you need insurance uh, to cover city liability. And for some of the neighborhood councils, that is available because I think two of our neighborhood councils have insurance and are 501c3s and you can uh, join them as a subcommittee and become a friends group that way. But for many of the neighborhood councils, that doesn't exist yet. And so uh, staff is going to be talking with the Office of Neighborhood Services about what we can do that would take a city council motion uh, to have the Office of Neighborhood Services perhaps adopt an insurance policy that covers all of the neighborhood councils so that as individuals and groups want to adopt their parks, that becomes a vehicle for them, and it's a natural tie-in with all the information that the neighborhood councils get from the public and provide to the city. It's just a really great way to activate those partnerships between parks and those neighborhood councils. So I drafted a letter of support as the chair of the DVC, and that's something that we will be working with park staff on. So then also, um, Garrett talked about our new um, 
uh, program manager for the Expo 50. He's an 18-month contract, and you all might have heard of him. His name is Matt Santangelo, and he will be working as our uh, program coordinator there for that upcoming celebration. And um, again, the ideas behind that upcoming celebration, embracing the past, celebrating where we are today, opportunities for the future. Matt will be working on creating that substructure for us. Um, there will be subcommittees through uh, on entertainment, marketing, uh, arts and culture, environmental stewardship, recreation, tribal issues, and of course the Expo legacy. So there will be more about that. Um, we hope to hear more about more from Matt and more about that um, on a regular basis. And now I will have Kelly come up and talk about the DVCAC. Um, the March meeting of the DVC, by the way, we've decided to cancel and wait until April because it would have happened the day before our park board retreat and I'm sure that the park board retreat will generate some initiatives and things we need to talk about. So we'll be moving that to the April 19th meeting. But Kelly, DVCAC. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, just a small update. We're working on going through Fiona's toolkit and we've divided it amongst our group members to give feedback for her. And just a quick update, we have members from the Friends of Manitou, Friends of Coeur d'Alene Park, Friends of Palisades, Friends of the Bluff, Friends of Riverfront, uh, Logan Neighborhood City Council, or um, city, uh, Council, not City Council, Friends of Spokane Skate Parks, and we have four vacancies currently. Thank you. So, and also, even if you haven't formed a Park Friends group and are officially invited to join the CAC with a seat, Remember, members of the public can attend these meetings, even if you're just at the Adopt-a-Park level or the volunteer level. We always like to have public participation, and Kelly is a great leader. So thank you, Kelly, for all your work. All right, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Kelly. Well, I guess we move to reports, and I will have a reminder of the board retreat next Thursday, March 16th, from 9 to 2 in the podium. Jerry and I will conduct the initial session focused on park board goals, priorities, and roles. This session will cover board member questions and comments supplied to the nominating committee. I know the last three years as a member of the nominating committee, we've often received the same requests or same thoughts, so we'll try to go over those during, during that initial session. The initial topic that we will start with what did we achieve in 2022? And what was the primary unfinished business? Please take some time to think about this before the retreat, as you will be called upon. We would like each member <laughs> to be asked to comment on these particular areas. So if you have the, you know, give it some thought. I'd like to thank Mark Bunig for his dedication to parks and working with the Finance Committee to develop more effective financial statements and board presentations. Mark was always very patient with us as we, as we went through numerous revisions. And in closing, if anyone is still singing or humming the words to let it snow, mm -hmm. please stop that. <laughs> Golf needs to get started. Absolutely. So I'm looking forward to working with you all at the retreat. And so now we move to other reports Nick Sumner with Conservation Futures. Nick. Nick, are you with us? I'm here, sorry, oh, uh, right. nothing to report. Okay, thank you, Nick. Parks Foundation, Barb. Well, hello, everybody. We did not meet, but there will be a meeting uh, between uh, some of the park board staff and the Parks Foundation and the uh, Spokane Humane Society on March 14th. Um, I will not be present, but I will um, read the notes and report on that next month. Um, and let's see. Oh, the fund balance uh, for the Parks Foundation is in your packet. In case you want to peruse that and have any questions, I'm sure new director Rich Lentz would love to um, answer those questions. <laughs> so thank you. That is the end of my report. Thank you, Barb. Do we have? No. All right. Councilman Bingle is not with us, so we will move to... Garrett Jones. All right. Well, I'll be brief. Uh, just like Bob, I would just want to have a success for the winter season in hopes we would just, we're closed. We're, we're in. Now we're moving to spring. Uh, so dream spring. Um, you can see right now we're decommissioning the ice ribbon across the street right now. See a bunch of piles of ice getting, um, starting to melt off, getting ready for the spring season. And then uh, again, I will be sending out some additional information on 
the agenda topics for the retreat. Thank you, uh, Bob and, and Jerry. Oh, we got a jam-packed day for you. It's going to be great. A um, lot of great topics, and it, I think it'll be a great atmosphere of where we're at um, at the podium. So I'll send you directions, where to go, what entrance, where to park. So you'll see all that, and then you'll see where, what the topics are, when lunch is, and then uh, when uh, the top, uh, then when we'll be leaving at 2 p.m. there. Um, and hopefully some of our local teams aren't playing. That's the first day of March Madness, <laughs> but we'll figure that out during the meeting. And then uh, Monday night, City Council will be considering an SBO from our REIT fund over to the Parks Fund for our 50% match of the South Suspension Bridge. So this is a huge deal for us. A uh, huge hurdle for us, and so this would take care of the South Suspension Bridge, not utilizing any park funds um, to reconstruct that bridge, and um, so and, and we'd be able to get it in, in constructed and completed in time before next spring, and so it's already out to advertise for bid this week, and so we'll find out more and then hope to come back to the April Park Board meeting for a contract approval. And then uh, with that, again, I want to thank Mark Buning for his service. And, you know, we're, we're a family here, so it's, it's sad to see him uh, leave. But uh, it's great to see Rich come in and be a part of the family now. And um, I have a feeling that Mark will be coming down every Thursday to testify at future <laughs> park board meetings because you just can't get away from us. But, no, uh, super, prou uh, super proud of him, super happy for him in his next adventures and his travels with his wife and his family. So... Thank you so much, Mr. Buning. With Garrett, that, end of report. Uh, Thank you, Garrett. Garrett, would there be any need for a park board member or two to attend the city council on Monday night, or is that not required? I think we're good. Okay. Um, I'll let you know if things change in that the next. That would be fine you know, if we're not needed. Forty-eight hours, but um, we've briefed it a few times, mm -hmm. and so far we haven't seen okay. any uh, negative feedback. So I think it's been a, a great partnership there. But thank you for the offer. All right. Any, anything else to add to today's meeting? Wow. Other than great job. New wow. Friends. Bob, we're glad you're here. Less well, thank you. Sure. I'm glad we're all here. <laughs> <laughs> so if not, I will adjourn the meeting at 423. All right. And well, that's my favorite part is getting that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Get it harder. If I ever miss it.